Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the privilege and the opportunity that we may come to know you as it is our privilege to know you. You have spoken your words of truth to us in a very powerful way night after night, and we trust that tonight would be no exception. There are many things happening in our world in which we must be mindful of what it is that we are presenting before us because there are things that are called deceptions, and these have its origin in the heart of Satan. And we know that Satan's desire is only to rob, to kill, to steal, and destroy. And so, Lord, we're asking you to please first forgive us of our sins, cleanse us, Lord, from all unrighteousness, and ap apply unto us the blood of Christ that washes away all of our sins. And then we also ask that you will give us your Holy Spirit, because he's the only effectual teacher of truth. He is the only way that we can have real power to overcome the temptations and the deceptions in this world. And I am asking you that you would please make your truth plain tonight. Help us to see it and understand it so well that by your grace we will be able to say we have heard the words of Jesus tonight and our hearts will never be the same. I am thankful that you've heard this prayer. I commit myself into your hands and may you take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. And this is my prayer and our prayer that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like to invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew, the 24th chapter. It is in Matthew 24 that we get a lot of the lessons of last day events. And therefore, we are in the book of Matthew, the 24th chapter. And when you get there, just let me know by saying amen. All right. So the Bible says in Matthew, the 24th chapter, we are now going to consider verse 1. And I want you to understand what the Bible says here. In Matthew 24, right here at verse 1, this is right after Jesus walked out of the temple. He made it clear to uh, those who were the leaders of the temple at that time. And he said, listen, your house is left unto you desolate. You read that in Matthew 23, 38. And Jesus walked out of that building never to return. Well, here it is that in Matthew 24 now, it says in verse 1, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, they wanted to know the sign of his coming. Was the, did they want to know the sign of his first coming? No, they did not because he was already there. So obviously this is the sign of his second coming. And connected with the second coming would be also the what of the world? The end of the world. So the end of the world and the second coming of Christ are the same. Now... When they asked this question, I thought it very interesting that Jesus starts his dialogue with these words in verse 4. It says in verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man does what? Deceives you. Christ understood there are powers and people that exist. That their life work, if you will, is to deceive and to steal away the truth from the minds of God's people. And therefore, Christ begins his dialogue by saying, you take heed, you protect yourself, you be careful that no man deceives you. And the reason this is important is because these words of Christ that was applicable to his disciples of old are the same words that are applicable to his disciples today. How many of you are familiar with a man by the name of the Apostle Paul? How many are familiar with the Apostle Paul? All right, well, many of us would be familiar with him. Well, the Apostle Paul, he is the wonderful New Testament teacher of righteousness. Uh, he wrote the majority of the books of the New Testament, and it was the Apostle Paul that was used mightily by God, not only to strengthen the Jewish brothers in the church, but especially to bring the gospel to the Gentile world, those who were not part of the Jewish community. Well... The Apostle Paul, I believe, had tremendous success in his work. What would you say? The reason I know the Apostle Paul had success in his work is because when you read 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, it literally tells us that Paul said, I finished my course. Now, anytime a man can say, I finished my course, he had success. True success, brothers and sisters, is not what man says. True success is what God says. And when God can let you know, well done, you have done everything I have told you to do. You have done a good job. You have had success. 
So Paul knew, I finished my course. Everything my father told me to do, I did it. Now, because the apostle Paul had success in his work, if someone were to ask you, what do you think was in the apostle Paul's life and ministry that enabled him to have such tremendous success in fulfilling the father's will? What would you say was some of the reasons? If somebody here to my left, if somebody asked you, what was one of the reasons you think that the apostle Paul had so much success in his ministry? What would somebody here say? Knowledge of the word. I like that. Very good. One more. Trust in God. Is that what I heard? Trust in God or faith? Yes. How about to my right? What would you say? What was it something about the Apostle Paul that you would say, I believe that because he had this, he was successful in his work? What would you say? Empowerment of the Holy Spirit. He was obedient to the law of God. Very good. Now, all of these things that you're saying are 100% true. But I'm going to show you something that also gave Paul success in his ministry that is often not considered. Are you ready to see it? Let's go to the book of 2 Corinthians. We're going to go to the book of 2 Corinthians. We're going to look at chapter uh, 11. 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And let's notice something the Bible says here. Very, very powerful. I was thinking 2 Corinthians 11, but it's really 2 Corinthians 2. And my key verse is verse 11. But we're going to look at a few verses before. Now, here's what happened. In the church of Corinth, there were a lot of people who did very, very vile and wicked sins. Literally, relatives were sleeping with each other. Brothers and sisters was taking each other to, to court and suing each other. I mean, there was some things happening in the church in Corinth that caused the Apostle Paul to have to write these letters to the Corinthians, okay? Well, a brother apparently fell into sin in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He fell into some kind of sin. Now Paul is counseling the brethren in the church on how to deal with this brother who fell. It starts in verse 8 where I'm going to pick up right here. And I want you to see what Paul tells the brethren in the church on how to deal with this brother who has fallen. It says in verse 8, wherefore I beseech you that you would do what? Confirm your love toward him. I love that. Even when people fall in the church, they should not necessarily just be immediately thrown out and cast away and be forgotten. Paul says, yes, this brother has fallen, but I want you to confirm him in your love. Now it goes on to say in verse 9, for to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. So notice he's going on and he's talking about the importance of confirming this fallen brother in love. He's talking about forgiving him because of his fall. And then he says something very important in verse 11. What's the first word in verse 11? Lest. You know another way of saying lest? Or else. Okay? So he's saying... Whoever you forgave, forgave I it also in the person of Christ, or else, what would happen to him? It says, or else Satan should get an advantage of us. Now watch the close of the verse, and you tell me another reason why Paul had success in his ministry. It says, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You know another reason why Paul had so much success in his ministry? Is because he understood his enemy. This is something people don't often think about. You see, many a times when Bible studies are done and it exposes Satan, when it exposes his tricks and his traps and his ways, many a times people will say, don't you talk about Satan upon the pulpit. You're giving glory to Satan. I respectfully disagree. The Bible does not teach that, brothers and sisters. The Bible shows that our success in our work is not simply going to be because we keep the law of God, because we're endowed with the Holy Spirit, because we have a knowledge of the word, or because of these other points. It's not limited to that. Another reason why we will have success in our work in ministry is because we understand our enemy and how he works. And Paul understood this. Did you know that even Jesus taught this? Somebody says, you mean Jesus taught understanding your enemy? Yes, I, yes, he did. Notice what the Bible says in Luke, the 14th chapter. Go to Luke 14. It is in Luke, the 14th chapter, that you see that Christ even endorsed the idea that 
if you're going to go into a war or into a battle, that it is imperative that you understand your enemy. And I want you to see how Jesus does it. In Luke 14, Luke 14 is what you call the discipleship qualifying chapter. In Luke 14, Jesus literally qualifies true disciples from false disciples. He starts it right there in verse 26. You'll see that he says, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he what? Now, is Jesus teaching us to hate our family members? But what did the Bible say? It just said, if any man hate not. So notice it says, if any man hate not, his father, mother, brother, sister, so on and so forth, even his own life, it says he can't be my disciple. So it would almost appear like he's teaching people to hate. That's the way the verse would look to some. But do you know what I like about the Bible? The Bible has a beautiful tendency to explain itself. You see, in Luke 14, 26, just keep your finger there, but go to Matthew 10. Let me just show you very quickly. I'm going to just let the Bible explain itself very quickly. In Matthew, the 10th chapter, let me show you what Jesus actually meant. When he said right there in Luke 14, if any man hate not father, mother, brother, sister, and so on, he's not worthy of me. Now watch the balance. Same, same story. We're reading Luke's account here. Now we're going to read Matthew's account. Matthew, he makes the point of Christ even more clear in Matthew 10 and verse 37. And if you're there, say amen. amen. Now the Bible says in Matthew 10 and verse 37, look at the clarity. It says, he that what? Loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me it says and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me so when jesus said in luke 14 26 if any man hate not father mother brother said he wasn't teaching us to hate our family he was saying do love your mother love your father but don't love them more than you love me and you know what that's sensible you know why because the whole re you know, do you know that there's death in this world today? Is there sickness and disease? Is there poverty in this world? Is there all sorts of suffering in this world? You want to know how it came? Because a man loved his wife more than he loved God. Do you understand? His name was Adam. When Adam saw his wife Eve fall into sin by disobeying and eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in total disobedience to the word of God, when she came to her husband and said, honey, you eat, that was his opportunity to choose who he loved more. And he did. He chose his wife. He loved his wife more than he loved God. And once he decided to partake of that fruit, death, sickness, disease, poverty, and suffering came into our world. So I think Jesus makes a lot of sense when he says, listen, I'm not telling you don't love your parents. He says, love your mother, love your father, love your son, love your daughter, all that, love them, but not more than me. Because God knows the pain that happens when a man will put another man before God. When a woman will put another woman before God. Christ knows. So in Luke 14, there's all these qualifiers for discipleship. God must be supreme, and so on and so forth. But now I want you to watch this one. In this one here, Jesus now begins to magnify another point in verse 27. In verse 27 of Luke 14, you're back there. I told you to keep your finger there. In Luke 14, now at verse 27, he says, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Well, somebody says, well, what does it mean to bear your cross? Well, again, scripture is always going to be the key that unlocks scripture. If you want to know what it means to bear the cross, go to Matthew 16. If you go to Matthew 16, you will know exactly what it means to bear the cross. The Bible makes it very clear in Matthew 16. We're just going down the qualifications for discipleship very quickly. It says in Matthew 16, we're going to consider verse 24. And here is where you can see biblically what it means to bear a cross. Because, again, if we're not willing to bear our cross, we can't be a disciple. Well, the Bible says in Matthew 16 and verse 24, and if you're there, say amen. amen. The Bible says in Matthew 16 and verse 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him do what? Deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So taking up or bearing a cross, it requires a denial of self. It requires a denial of what I want for the purpose of fulfilling what God wants. Are you following? 
So Jesus is teaching these things. Now watch how he begins to magnify his teachings and getting to the point of the connection with what we just read with the Apostle Paul as we go back to Luke 14. And now let's take it from verse 28 to 31. Notice what the Bible says as we're back in Luke 14. And now we're going to go from verse 28 to 31. The Bible says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Now watch verse 31 carefully. Or what king, it says, going to make war against another king. So is Jesus talking about warfare? Is he talking about warfare? Yes, he is. He says, What king goeth to war against another king watch it says or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down when first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000 do you see how Jesus is using natural things natural occurrences in life to teach spiritual lessons Jesus says listen it would be foolish for a man to start building something and he did not have su sufficient supplies to finish what he started. Jesus says that person would begin to be mocked and look foolish. Well, here it is. He says, oh, what king is going to go to a war except he first sits down and thinks, what does my enemy have? And then let me make sure I have what I need so that I can overcome my enemy. Even Jesus taught and believed that if you are going to go into warfare, it is intelligent to think what is the power source that my enemy has, what are the tactics that my enemy has, so that I can make sure when he comes to me with it, I can know how to stand though the heavens may fall. And therefore, brothers and sisters, Jesus says, take heed. The Apostle Paul says, listen, I got to be careful because if I don't do things right, Satan can get an advantage over me because I know his wiles. Jesus says, don't you dare go to a war. If an earthly king will not go to an earthly war without understanding his earthly enemy, what in the world would spiritual princes and queens and, and, and spiritual kings, what in the world would we be doing going into a spiritual warfare and not understand our enemy, the devil? And the reason this is so important, brothers and sisters, is because we are living in a time where many of us are sometimes sleeping with the enemy. Many a times we are living in a time right now where we are literally calling the devil our enemy, but in truth, he's our friend once we carefully analyze ourselves. So this is why we're living in a time where the tactics and the wiles of the devil must be exposed so that we can take heed. And if there is one area where the devil has had tremendous success in this world is on the question, what happens to a man and to a woman when they die? This question you are going to see has had sweeping force in our world today, and it has caused the sadness and woe and great deceptions of millions upon millions of people in our society. And this is why God wants to make things plain tonight. So when we think about this, I want to show you something here. Let's turn back to the screen now. I want you to take a look at this, and we're going to consider a definition of a term. The term that we're going to be looking at is none other than a term called spiritualism. So we're going to take a look here, if we can get the screen up, friends. We can go ahead and let's take a look. It's not connected. It's not moving. And everything is connected. I'm going to unplug. We're going to go ahead and plug it back in. All right. All right. Thank you very much. So here goes the definition. This word spiritualism, this is something that we really need to make sure we understand. This term spiritualism is a belief that departed spirits hold intercourse with mortals by means of physical phenomena as by rapping or during and rapping but that's not talking about you know the hip-hop industry that's that's rapping like when windows begin to open and close and doors begin to open and shut and things that when it use the word rapping it's talking more so in that context it says physical phenomena as by rapping or during abnormal mental states as in trances or the like commonly manifested through a medium which is called spiritism 
Spiritualism is the most popular form of entertainment in our world today. Let me repeat that. Spiritualism is the most popular form of entertainment in our world today. And I believe even in this room, there are many of us that like to be entertained. We like TV, we like movies, we like books, we like all sorts of things. And you're going to see that spiritualism, we are literally surrounded by the influences of something called spiritualism. And again, what is spiritualism? Just remember, it's a belief that departed spirits, people who lived, then they died, and their departed spirit can hold intercourse with mortals, with us. And they do it through all these different manifestations. Now, the very origin of how this came was through none other than the serpent, Satan himself. It was right there in the Garden of Eden where the devil told his first lie. And the question is, well, what was that lie? It is, and the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. The woman made it clear. God understood and God made it clear. The day that you eat of this, you're going to die. You're going to literally start dying and you will be separated from me. Well, the serpent says, did God really say that? She said, yes, he did. And then he went and said, you shall not. So this is the first lie that Satan told on this earth. He told the lie that, listen, you're not going to die. You're going to actually live and you're going to be very powerful. And today we are still hearing that. Some people think that the best of life comes when you sin. This is literally what Satan taught. God has always taught people that life and the greatest happiness is in obedience to my law. But the world today believes the more that we break the law of God, the more fun we will have. This is literally, in principle, the repetition of the serpent, you shall not surely die. The Bible says the wages or the payment of sin is death. Now, all of us have worked sin at some point in our life. Is that right? Now, you know, you know what's amazing? When we work, we want to get paid, don't we? When you work, you want to get paid. This is the only time that I've ever worked that I don't want to get my wages. You understand? I do not want my wages. Because the Bible says the wages, the payment for sin is death. But I'm so thankful that that's not how the verse finished. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And brothers and sisters, I want that gift. How about you? So we can't buy into this lie. The lie of Satan in the time of the beginning is the lie of Satan even today. Satan says, in sinning, you become more like God. The world today says, in sinning and violating God's law, disregarding his word, disregarding God himself, claiming yourself to be God, you shall have a greater existence. It's the same lie perpetuated. It's just in different format. You understand? So therefore, this lie goes way back that even in sin, you shall be immortal. And this was the very lie of Satan himself. And this is why this lie needs to be debunked. This lie needs to be made clear because we are living in a generation where the great grand majority of this world believes this lie. And it's not just worldlings. I'm talking about church people. The lie of Satan is taught in the great majority of Christian churches today. And you shall see what I mean shortly. You see, the Bible makes it very clear. What happens when a person dies? The Bible's clear on it. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. And the what? The spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So this is what the Bible says happens to someone when they die. The Bible makes it very clear when a person dies, it says the dust returns to the earth and the spirit returns unto God. But notice how the verse finishes. It says returns unto God who? Who gave it. So that means that at some point in creation, God gave man spirit. Is that right? Now, this is the word that has created a lot of confusion today. I remember years ago, I used to watch a movie, uh, Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore, and it was called Ghost. And it was all about a couple who loved each other, went down in the alleyway, somebody, one of them got shot down and killed. And when he died, it was like his body was laying on the ground, but there was this entity that came out, looked just like him, talked just like him, and could even learn to communicate and all these other things. And this today is what a lot of the world believes is truth. This is what today a lot of people believe is actually happening in our world today. And we're going to talk about it because this thing needs to be made plain. So therefore, one of the first things I think we need to do 
is we need to understand terms. You will be amazed at how powerful it is when you can understand terms and words in the Bible because Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So do you think it's important to pay attention to words? Yes, so notice, when you think of the word spirit, I want to show you some things here. Number one, when you think of the word spirit, if we were to consider it in the Hebrew, it's a word called ruach. Now, I want you to look at all these words here for spirit because it's going to be important in our study. Number one, it can mean what? Wind. It says by resemblance, what else? Breath. So notice that the word spirit can also be applied to breath. Now, it also says sensible or even violent wind or breath. It says exhalation. So another word for spirit is actually exhalation, which still is dealing with breath. Is that right? Okay. Notice, figuratively, life. So the word spirit can mean life. It can mean anger. It can mean unsubstantiality. By extension, a region of the sky. It can, it can be the resemblance spirit, but only for a rational being, including its expressions and functions. The word spirit can also mean air, anger, blast, breath, cool, courage, mind, quarter, side, spirit, tempest, vein, wind, or windy. Now, you know what I don't see there? I don't see a living entity that can communicate outside of the body. The thing that, that, that blows me away because that's what I don't see. You understand? But today, when we think of spirit, is that not the very first thing that comes to our mind? When we use the word spirit, we think about a being that's intelligent, that can communicate, that can come outside of the body and fly and talk and move and reason and do all these things. But is that what the Bible is teaching on the word spirit? That's not even what the Bible teaches. You would be amazed at how much stuff we believe that is what's called extra biblical. It can't be found in the Bible. But it is found in paganism. It's, pa it's found in all sorts of Eastern religions and pagan religions that a lot of this stuff has merged into the church. And tomorrow night when we talk about Babylon, you'll understand where it came from. So therefore, this is what the word spirit means in the Hebrew, which is what we just read in Ecclesiastes 12. Well, also, spirit in the Greek, a little bit different. But watch this. Spirit in the Greek is neuma. Now, what does the word spirit mean in Greek? It's a current of air, breath, blast, or breeze. By analogy or figuratively, a spirit. Human, the rational soul. By implication, vital principle, mental disposition. Or superhuman, an angel, a demon, or divine God like Christ's spirit or the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Life and mind. When it pertains to man, because are men angels? No. Are men the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost? No. So everywhere else where the word spirit is used, it can speak about our emotions, it can speak about our breath, but does it speak anything about a being inside of us that can come out and communicate, fly, talk, and do all these other things? Yes or no? No. So the question is, where did we get it from? You know where we got it from? We heard it from people that stand where I stand often. We got it from movies and books and every place else, but we didn't get it from the Bible. And I'm telling you right now, you and I must learn something very important. When you come to church or any religious institute, when you come there, when you come, are you looking for a blessing or a curse? Which one are you looking for? All right, so I'm going to ask you a question. This is a very simple question. I'm going to ask you a question. When you came here tonight, did you come here for a blessing? Raise your hand. Just, just, just let me, I just, need to, I just need to understand. All right, so when you came here tonight, you came for a blessing. How many in this room came here tonight for a curse? Well, isn't that interesting? Not one of you came for a curse. Well, watch this. Go to the book of Jeremiah, the 17th chapter. Let me show you something. It is possible to come to a church seeking a blessing and leave with a curse. And I want to show you how, because God doesn't want you to leave with a curse. He wants you to leave blessed. The Bible says in Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, and when you get there, just say amen. Now watch this carefully. In Jeremiah 17, notice what the Bible says as we consider verse 5. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, verse 5, Thus saith the Lord, what does it say? Cursed be the man that does what? That trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm. 
You see, when you come to church and the best thing you can leave with is what the man said, and you begin to quote truth based on what you heard a man say, you can literally invite a curse on your life because we're putting our trust in men. So God says, cursed be the man that puts his trust in men and make his flesh his arm. But watch this. What does it say in verse 7? Same book, same chapter, but what does it say right there? Two verses up in verse 7. It says what? Blessed is the man that does what? Trust in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. So every single one of us tonight, we stand in the midst of curses and blessings. And you're going to decide which one you leave with. If you are going to continue life believing what men say, you shall live under the worst of curses. Because the arms of flesh will fail you, brothers and sisters. Even the arms of flesh that stand on pulpits. Ministers are to be respected. Ministers should certainly be treated with respect. That's not an issue. But ministers are not to be trusted. You put your trust in God. Your trust is in God. I can respect a man. I can encourage a man. I can be friendly to a man, but I will not put my trust in a man. You got to learn how to live like that. I know people right now, I only care what my bishop says. I only care what my priest says. Don't you talk about my pope like that. Don't you talk about my pastor like that. And people love to just stand by their bishops, priests, pastors, and popes, and they love to stand by these individuals and put their trust in them. The Bible says, brothers and sisters, cursed be the man that puts his trust in man. And it does not matter what position that man stands in, whether he's pastor, whether he's bishop, whether he's priest, even if he's pope. Every man is a sinner where the grace of God is available to save him. And if he accepts that grace for real, then he's simply a sinner saved by grace. But brothers and sisters, you don't put your trust in sinners saved by grace. You put your trust in God, brothers and sisters, you'll be saved from a thousand perils. You'll be saved from a thousand perils. And so it is, brothers and sisters, that we are to understand we're looking up the word spirit right now and we are not seeing what the great majority of the religious world says our spirits are. You ever hear people say, I just don't feel, I just feel it in my spirit. I used to be in churches like that, where I used to be in church and people love to get excited. All oh, shoulders start going up and they start running all up and down the pews and doing all this stuff. And they say, I feel it in my spirit. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What spirit? What are you talking about? Well, it, well I'll tell you this. There is a spirit that's called a demon. Is that the spirit you're talking about that's impressing you right now? Or is it the Holy Spirit? Maybe it's an angel, but don't tell me you have a spirit. You and I don't have any spirit. We don't have any being inside of us. I mean, we can almost just say amen and close out the night and everybody can go home and have an early night. But you know how it is. I know we, we have so much that we've been taught. We got to we got to wean out the error out of our minds. You understand? So therefore, we're going to take our time and go through this. So remember, it says. In fact, I'll ask you the question. It says when a man dies, it says what goes back to the ground? The dust. And then it says and the spirit goes back to God who gave it. Question. Based on the Hebrew, because remember, it was, a, it, was in, it was Hebrew, the Old Testament. How should we understand the spirit goes back to God who gave it? What would we understand that spirit to be then? Breath. Question. Let me ask you something. What's the last thing a person does when they die? They exhale. Is that right? No one ever dies by going. The last thing a person does when they die is. And they breathe their last breath, don't they? So therefore, the breath goes back to God who gave it. Now, remember, it said who gave it. So the question is, when did God give it? So now we're going to go ahead and consider the verse. So let's now go ahead and consider. What did man receive when he was created anyhow? What did he receive? Well, let's notice. The Bible's very clear on this. It says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. So when man dies, he goes back to the us makes perfect sense it says and breathed into his what nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul so notice when man was made he came from the dust of the ground God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life 
and man becomes a living soul. Now watch this. This gets really sweet. Notice this. What is the spirit that returns to God at death then? Watch the verse carefully. Did you know Job says all the while, my breath is in me. But then watch how Job uses a parallel term now. Look at what it says. And notice where this parallel term is. It says, and the spirit of God is in my what? Nostrils. What did we just read was in, in man's nostrils? The breath of life. But what's it being called here in the book of Job? It's being called the what of God? The spirit of God. So the spirit of God would be the breath of God. Is that right? You understand this? Do you see how the Bible, the Bible can be understood. The Bible can be made plain. And yes, it is going to debunk a lot of the lies we've been taught. But brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, all of us would do well with some good brainwashing. Did you understand that? I didn't say all of us would do well with some brainwashing. I said all of us would do well with some good brainwashing. In other words, we have put sometimes so much filthy error in our brains that it's all right to have ourselves a good brainwashing. Wash away that filth. Wash away those errors and fill our minds with the beautiful agent of God's truth. So therefore, when we look at this point, it shows the spirit of God is what was in our nostrils, the breath of God itself. It says the body without the spirit, which is actually breath, is dead. So therefore, when you think of this word spirit, we are thinking about the term in the context of what man had. We are seeing that what was it that went back to God? It was the breath. If you understand what the preacher is saying thus far, let me hear you say amen. amen. All right. So let's go further. Content, consider this question. What is a soul? Because a lot of us believe that we have an immortal soul. Well, the Bible says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man what? So notice, did the Bible say man received a living soul? It says man what? So that means that the combining of dust of the ground and breath of life creates a living soul. So we are living souls. We do not have a living soul. Do you understand? Now watch this. Do souls die? The answer is yes. So ladies and gentlemen, and this, this is probably where English class has, would be very helpful to us. When you look up the word immortal, what does immortal mean? It means not subject to death. If you are immortal, you cannot die. You understand? So, when you think about immortal soul, we're talking about a soul that cannot what? Die, if, this is, if there's a such thing. Now, there are people today who teach that we have immortal souls. The question is, is it true? So, therefore, we're asking, do souls die? Well, let's notice what the Bible says. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Is that clear? Now watch this. Every living soul died in the... Is that talking about human beings? No, that's talking about fish. That's talking about the water life animals. So that means that fish and sharks and whales and eels and lobsters and crabs and oysters and all of these things, they're actually in the eyes of God considered to be little souls. You understand? So a soul is not a ghost-like entity that flies around and talks and moves around and all these other things like many believe. This is the deception of Satan. And you'll see where it comes. It's, go, it's going very, very easily. So think about it. So what we have here is that body minus breath equals dead soul. The same way breath plus dust makes living soul, body goes back to the dust, Breath goes back to God, so we now are a dead soul. And that's what it is. So therefore, there's no such thing as a soul that's immortal flying around and all these things like many people believe today. According to God's word, souls do die. We are souls and souls die. Man is mortal, Job 4, 17. Only God is immortal, 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. Immortality is a gift from God reserved only for the righteous. The concept of an undying immortal soul goes against the Bible, which teaches that souls are subject to death. So this is why the funerals, when they generally happen, it's sad. Because a lot of times the ministers are putting people into heaven 
and saying, we know that mama so-and-so, daddy so-and-so, aunt and uncle so-and-so, brother so-and-so, and it almost seems like it is irrelevant how, what kind of life they lived. It is completely irrelevant. And I was personally insulted when, when, when my mother died. You know, I knew my mother. I knew my mother. I talked to my mother two hours before she breathed her very last breath. And when I, you know, and I was so grateful because my mother wanted me to do the eulogy at her funeral. And I told my mother, I said, it would be my pleasure. And they had a minister come, and this minister, he doesn't understand the things we're talking about tonight. So this minister came, he doesn't even know my mother. And his brother's standing in front of my mother's casket, and he's, Mama Lorraine is in heaven right now. Mama Lorraine is in heaven. I'm like, bro, you don't even know my mother. How do you know where my mother is? You don't even know it. In other words, it's like ministers, they come in and they just do their jobs, quote unquote, and just go putting people into heaven. And the book of Romans, the 10th chapter, literally says, say not who shall ascend into heaven. So here it is, he's saying that, but you know what was so beautiful? He had the first say, I had the last. And I came up there and I let my family members and everybody else know, I said, mom is not in heaven. And thank God she is not in hell. I said, mom is sleeping in Jesus. And mom will be waiting for the trumpet sound when the dead in Christ shall rise. And literally, we, we made it plain that day. But it's amazing because no matter how a person lived, they could have lived a life totally sinning against God and doing everything wrong. But it's amazing how many, he's in heaven right now. He's, we put everybody in heaven. But brothers and sisters, this is not what the Bible teaches. You understand? And listen, for some people, this is hard because what we're studying tonight, it can challenge our emotions because there's some people who say, are you telling me my dead nephew that I talk to regularly, are you telling me that's not my nephew? Are you telling me that my dead mother, my dead nephew, my dead cousin, my dead child, are you telling me that's not them? And listen, brothers and sisters, I say it not with a smile on my face, but I say it with love in my heart, thank God, no. It is not your family. That is not your family. Somebody says, well, who it is? You shall find out shortly. And you'll thank God that you found out tonight. Because we have an enemy, and his name is Satan, and his mission is to deceive. But the words of Jesus says, let no man deceive you. So notice, soul, what does it mean? In the Hebrew, nephesh. Notice this, it's very interesting. Properly, a breathing creature. These are the terms for soul. A breathing creature, animal. That's why it could say the souls in the sea died, because a soul can be an animal. It says an animal of vitality, used very widely in a literal, accommodated, or figurative sense, bodily or mental. Any appetite, beast, body, breath, creature, desire, contented, fish. It says ghost, greedy, heart, jeopardy of life, lust, man, me, mind, mortally, one, own, person, pleasure, themselves, slay, tablet, Thing. So notice that the grand majority of this term soul, it is not referring to some type of entity. And again, the only time the word ghost is applied is when it was talking about the Holy Spirit or the angels or the demons. That's the only time it's applied. How about the New Testament? New Testament, soul, Greek, is suke, breath, spirit abstractly or concretely, the animal sentient principle only, thus distinguished on the one hand, and, and all it does is it compares it to the original word spirit. Literally, it compares it to the original word spirit, which is mere vitality, even of plants. And these terms thus exactly correspond respectively to the Hebrew. Life, mind, you. So where did we get that it's a ghost inside of us? We have to ask ourselves this question. And this is why I want us to think a little bit, because now we're going to progress a lot faster in our study because we wanted to make these things plain. Let's get to the bottom of it. Where are these ideas? If it's not in the Bible, then where did these ideas come from anyhow? So let's notice. Do good people go to heaven when they die? Let's notice what the Bible says. All that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. All that are in the graves. Notice. David is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. For David is what? Not ascended into the heavens. Now, brothers and sisters, David is not ascended into heavens. Go to the book of 1 Kings 14. Do you know what God's last comment was about David? 
I want you to see what God's last comment was about David. If anybody deserved to go to heaven, it was David. Notice what God's comment was about David in 1 Kings, the 14th chapter, and we're going to go ahead and consider verses 7 and 8. And I want you to see this, 1 Kings 14, and we're going to look at verses 7 and 8. And, I, and, and it, if David, with this, this description by God about David, if David is not in heaven, who else should be in heaven? So notice this, the Bible says in 1 Kings 14, starting at verse 7, if you're there, say amen. The Bible says, go tell Jeroboam, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, for as much as I exalted thee from among the people and made thee prince over my people Israel and rent the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it thee. Now watch how this verse closes. And yet thou hast not been as my servant David. So God is comparing Jeroboam to David. He says, you have not been as my servant David. Now watch how God describes David. He says, who did what? Who kept my commandments. So the closing context of David's life, he was a commandment keeper. Is that right? Then it says, who kept my commandments. And then it says, who followed me with all his heart. That sounds good or bad? That sounds extremely good. And then the last one, it says to do that. And what's the next word? Only, which was right in mine eyes. Now, if God can say about a man at the close of his life, you have kept my commandments. You have followed me with all your heart. You have only done that, which is right in mine eyes. Does that sound like somebody that belongs in heaven? You better believe it. But what did the Bible say? The Bible says David is not ascended into the heavens. Even David has to wait in the grave until the trumpet sounds. Now, if a man who kept, again, if you're at a funeral and you think about that person who is deceased, did they keep all of God's commandments? Did they follow God with all their heart? Did they do that only, which was right in God's eyes? For some people, the answer is no, yet they get to go to heaven and David doesn't? That doesn't even sound fair. So this is why we have to help people understand what the Bible teaches. All are in their graves and they're waiting to hear the voice of the archangel. And when they hear that voice, then they shall rise and they'll go home with Jesus, but not now. So notice, if I wait the grave is mine house. So the Bible is clear. When a person dies, they remain in that grave in an unconscious state. In fact, you will notice that the Bible says something very, very powerful. How much does one know or comprehend after death? Now, this is very encouraging. It states, the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not how many things? Anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. There is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. It says the dead praise not the Lord. So when somebody says my father's in heaven praising the Lord, is it true? Do you understand saints? I've been told this about my father. I've been told this about my mother, by some of my own relatives. They will tell me, Daddy is praising the Lord. I'm like, the Bible says the dead are not praising God. I mean, that is a direct, that is a direct contradiction to what the Bible says. It feels good, though, doesn't it? Saints, listen, let's be honest. For some people, in our initial emotion, it feels good to think Dad's up in heaven praising the Lord. I understand that, but you know what? I am thankful that the dead know not anything. I am thankful that the dead are in an unconscious state and they have no more love or hatred, envy. They don't have any of these things. You know why I'm happy about it? Because it was in 2007 that my mother died and my father was still alive. And brothers and sisters, I, you know, I often think about this. When my father was alive after my mother died, he went to such a deep state of depression. Not only that, he went to a deep state of depression. Then on top of his deep state of depression, dad also 
was not cleaning himself and taking care of himself. He was hardly getting any sleep, and he would often cry out every night, Lorraine, 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 and he's calling out for mom, but he's not hearing any answer. The dog would begin running through the house and would leave fecal matter all over the house. The house was an absolutely unhealthy, unhygienic mess. My father's physical condition got worse and worse and worse. His cataracts, his diabetes, everything got worse. He eventually got admitted into a nursing home. In the nursing home, there were people who were verbally abusive and sometimes physically. Then on top of that, dad had to go through medications and all these other things and was suffering and suffering and suffering. Now you tell me, if you had somebody that you love that was down there like that, could you really party in heaven? Could you really? Brothers and sisters, can you really party in heaven if you know the person that you've pledged your life to, you are watching them down there going through all this suffering and you're just like, well, too bad. Let's just get on with our little joyful party in heaven. Does that even make sense, brothers and sisters? I wish people would think more, brothers and sisters. Heaven would not be heaven. How in the world can you rejoice? Brothers, how can we rejoice if we're watching our loved ones dying and going through? The earth is getting worse. Everything's getting worse. But, but we're, just, we're just selfishly thankful we're not in that bad place and we're in the good place. What kind of picture is that? That's not a picture the Bible gives. God knew man whom I have created is one day going to choose to break my heart and sin against me. And Christ said, when it happens, I got to leave heaven and I got to come down and save man. Because Jesus knew I cannot be up in heaven just enjoying the angels say, holy, holy, holy unto me. And just enjoying all of this while I know that my people are down there dying. And I'm just going to sit up here and enjoy my little celestial heavenly realm while I'm there. And do you know when Jesus went back to heaven, he didn't, he didn't get involved in no party. We learned last night when Jesus finished his work on earth, he said, you know what? I just finished my work on earth. Now I'm going to go do some more work in heaven. And then when Jesus got up to 1844, we learned that Jesus moved from one apartment to another apartment to continue the work. So you know what he can do? Finish the work. And it's when he finishes the work, that's when Christ says, now I'm going to come down and get my people. Second coming. When he comes down and gets his people, he's going to save them from not just the penalty, but the power as well as the presence of sin. And when he does all that and brings them up, then it's party time. But there's no party while people are suffering and dying and going through pain. What kind of nonsense is this? And yet this is what's being taught in so many religious realms today. Daddy's just up in heaven praising God. I can guarantee you, none of our daddies, none of our children, none of our parents are in heaven praising God. Because it would be hard to do so if they could honestly see what some of us have even gone through in the past few years since they passed. So the Bible makes it clear, the dead do not praise the Lord. That's not what's happening right now. They are staying in the grave waiting to hear the voice. Well, let's go on. Who are the dead? You know, people like to play games. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The dead uh, are not praising God, but his spirit is. Well, we clarified that, didn't we? We clarified, there ain't no spirit praising God. We clarified that. We're intelligent people now, aren't we? We've studied the word. We look more carefully at the word. We see, no, 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 there is no spirit praising God. We've studied but let's talk about it. Who are the dead? Well, let's look at it. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. Notice again, number 1648. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. So what do we see as the contrast? Dead and living, right? We're talking about who are the dead. Ecclesiastes 9 5 for the living know that they shall die but the dead know not anything neither have they any more a reward for the memory of them is forgotten how about this one Romans 14 9 for to this end Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and living so you want to know who the dead are they are opposite of the living they're not living you see that why do I make this point? Because the people like to play games with these terminologies in the Bible. Oh, my, my father's still living. He's just, he's just in a different phase of life. If your father's dead, he is not part of the living. The Bible contrasts the two. It's simple. 
Are you understanding thus far? So let's go on. But can't the dead communicate with the living? And aren't they aware of what the living are doing? Well, we just looked at that. So man lieth down and riseth not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. His sons come to honor and he knoweth it not. This gave me a whole new attitude on graveyard visitations. Seriously. My brothers and my sisters sometimes thought it, be, it was disrespectful because I did not go to my parents' grave. I said, listen, do you think that they're mad at me? They're not mad at me. Mom and dad are sleeping. Mom and dad do not know I'm there. You can sit there. In other words, it might be for your psychology. It might be for your psychological peace, but it's not for theirs. You understand? Because the Bible's clear. It says his sons, notice, his sons come to honor and he knows it not, and they are brought low, but he perceives it not of them. So when we go to the grave, and we, you, know, you, know, you know, this happened today, dad and mom and so on and so forth, all we're doing is do, we're talking to ourselves, but we are not talking, they can't hear us, and they do not perceive that we are even there. And the reason why this is dangerous, and this is why I'm telling you, if you're one of those individuals that like to visit the graveyard and talk to the deceased and all these things, you would be very careful, brothers and sisters. Because you're about to see it. Look, neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. No more anything, a portion of anything that is done under the sun. It makes it clear, no, the dead cannot contact the living, nor do they know what the living are doing. They are dead. Their thoughts have perished, the Bible says. So they don't have any thoughts in all these different things. Satan will have us to believe otherwise. Jesus called the unconscious state of the dead sleep. And the question is, how long will they sleep? Well, notice, so man lieth down and riseth not till the heavens be no more. That's Job 14, 12. 2 Peter 3, 10. The day of the Lord will come in the which the heaven shall pass away. So we know the day of the Lord has not come yet. The heavens have not passed away. So man is still lying down. Then it says, what happens to the righteous dead at the second coming of Christ? Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Then it says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the dead in Christ shall rise. The dead in who? In Christ shall rise and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and the dead shall be raised incorruptible for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Only the dead in Christ are the ones that receive immortality. Immortality is a gift. So it only belongs to the faithful. It belongs to those who have given their lives unto the Lord. But if an individual has not done that and if they live the life in sin, they cannot claim this promise. Now, watch this. The devil's first lie again. You shall not surely die. This, brothers and sisters, is being perpetuated all throughout our world through the medium of, again, spiritualism. What is spiritualism? It is when people believe that departed spirits, ghost-like spirits, can actually communicate with mortals, and they manifest it in several different ways. Well, the reason this is important is because it is one of the cornerstones of the devil's kingdom. He has worked powerful miracles down through the ages through people who claim to receive their power from the spirits of the dead. The Bible talks about the magicians of Egypt in Exodus 7 in verse 11. There was the woman or the witch of Endor in 1 Samuel 28, 3 to 25. And when you read 1 Samuel 28, many people say, oh, that was Samuel talking. No, the, the witch said, I perceive that this, or rather Saul says, I perceive that this was Samuel. It did not say it was Samuel. He says, I perceive it was him. So therefore, it says sorcerers, Daniel 2 and verse 2, a certain damsel in Acts 16, 16 through 18. In the end times, Satan will again use sorcery as he did in Daniel's day to deceive the world. Sorcery is a supernatural agency that claims to receive its power and wisdom from the spirits of the dead. So in these last days of earth's history, there's going to be a lot of sorcery that's going to be taking place. And it's going to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. This is why the question is, do devils really work miracles? Notice, in Revelation 16, 14, they are the spirits of devils working miracles. So can Satan do a miracle? 
Can Satan impersonate your dead relatives? Yes, he can. Go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Watch this. In 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, I want you to see what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to look at verse 14. And when you get there, say amen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, notice what the Bible says in verse 14. Now watch this carefully. It says, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So Satan can do what? He can transform himself and appear like an angel of light, right? Now watch verse 15. It says, therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, we can call them demons, also be transformed as the what? Ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So can demons appear like ministers of righteousness? Have you ever heard people say they saw a minister of righteousness by this name of Mary? You ever heard that? You ever heard on the news people said, oh, we saw the minister of righteousness. We saw Mary. You ever heard that? You ever hear people say we saw departed saints? Brothers and sisters, these are demons. It's for the purpose to deceive when Jesus says, let no man do what? Deceive you. Now watch this. So the spirits of devils, they can definitely work miracles. In Matthew 24, verse 24, it says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So this becomes a very serious issue, brothers and sisters, that the devil is going to do all that he can to try to deceive and make it appear that the dead are not really dead. Now, brothers and sisters, here's where we get to the meat of it. It is 825. I'm aware of the time. And what we're going to do is we're going to move through this expeditiously. But brothers and sisters, you need to know what we're going to talk about right now. You need to understand it. So please bear with me. I'm aware of the time. Let's just go ahead and let's work it through. Watch. You'll remember back in the days, many of us grew up watching something called Bugs Bunny. And there was something called Bugs Bunny. And, they, and you know, Yosemite Sam, Daffy Duck, and all these guys. And what would happen is they would die. You know, they would take a gun and shoot each other and all these things. And they go ahead and then a ghost-like thing would come out and start flying up into heaven. And then it went from Looney Tunes. And then it started getting into, you know, again, Yosemite Sam, Sylvester the Cat, and all these things. This, this was big stuff. We used to watch these cartoons, many of us. Some of us are cartoon lovers even today. And you would watch these things. And then, of course, there was Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo was all about spiritualism. Did you know that? It was all about spiritualism because Scooby-Doo was not Scooby-Doo if it didn't have some stories about a ghost. If it didn't have a story about a departed spirit. Is that right? So these were things that existed. Now, you'll remember there was even video games. You ever heard of Pac-Man? What was Pac-Man all about? It was about a little chomping creature of some kind. And then he would go ahead and he would bite a ghost. And then the ghost would start floating around and moving all around. And then the ghost would get you. So think about it. From a child, Satan has entered the entertainment industry through video games, through cartoons, and all these things, and he was trying to already put the seeds of spiritualism in our minds. What was his point? He wanted to desensitize us. He wanted it to make it not look so bad. So therefore, add some jokes, make it laughable. And then after the video games, after Dragon's Lair, Space Ace, Mortal Kombat, all these video games, spiritualism, Departed spirits communicating with mortals in different ways. Then, after that, a big hit came in the 1990s. 1997. Big hit came. Harry Potter. Harry Potter became so popular, brothers and sisters. Harry Potter is completely about spiritualism. Completely. It's all about departed spirits, magic, so-called gods, so-called saints, and all these other things. In fact, Harry Potter's series became so popular that literally, let me show you an article that just came out just a couple of weeks, not even, just last Friday. Huffington Post, Rachel Ratzka, September 19th, 2014. Researchers from several European universities found that reading Harry Potter may make young people more tolerant. 
It says, in the study, the greatest magic of Harry Potter is reducing prejudice. Did you hear that? They said the greatest revelation or the greatest benefit to the youth is that reading Harry Potter removes prejudice. Now watch what they said next. It says, psychologists led by Loris Vazelli at the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia say that reading Harry Potter improves attitudes towards stigmatized groups such as immigrants, gays, and refugees. So they're actually recommending that Harry Potter would be put in the schools and in the universities so that way when individuals read it, they can learn how to become better people. Interesting, you shall not surely die. When you believe my lie, you will become better people. Are you following the lie of the serpent saints? Now watch this, all of these things are coming to pass and then it was after Harry Potter that it started getting more into these programs, True Blood. Not only that, True Blood, but then also Twilight. What were these, what are these movies and these sitcoms and these programs about? They're all about the dead are not really dead. Spiritualism at a high level. Right now there's even a program on television by a gentleman named Omar Epps and many others, and it's called Resurrection. It's a TV series. And right now this is making big news. And this is playing on many of sometimes even our TV sets. We are filling our minds with spiritualism on a regular basis. We don't understand the setup. You see, there's a setup with spiritualism. What's the setup, somebody says? Well, think about it this way. Once a person can be convinced that the dead are not really dead, once we can be convinced, then not only the dead are not really dead, but when you die, you ascend to a higher existence. Was that not what Satan said? You shall not surely die, but you shall become as gods. Remember, that's what he said in the book of Genesis. So he's lying to the people that when you die, you go to a higher existence. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, all it takes, we have watched so much spiritualism, we have listened to it, we have learned it in various religious realms, television, books, movies, everything, so that what happens is one day, somebody says to a little boy, let us tie a bomb to you. And when we tie the bomb to you, what you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and you're going to walk to a certain area where there's a lot of people. And when you go to that area where there's a lot of people, we want you to be prepared to give your life. And when you give your life, you will ascend into another place where there'll be lots of virgins waiting for you. And you'll ascend into a higher existence. Those little innocent boys buy into it. Those little innocent boys, they feel good about it. They pat them on the head. They tell them, you're one of our teammates. You're one of our buddies. They have been convinced that the dead are not really dead. You just ascend into another existence. And one day that little boy goes into that crowded area, nervous, but he's encouraged on by his comrades and his partners. He's been deceived enough that he gets to the point and that little boy, he decides to press the button. And when he presses the button, brothers and sisters, people die. People die. It happens right now. And how does this happen? Believe it or not, this is because of the lie of spiritualism. Spiritualism is teaching people you don't really die. You just ascend into a better existence, a happier existence. And there are certain radical sects that obviously practice that. And if you don't believe me, all you got to do is go to the news. It's all over the place. And somebody says, oh, well, that's, that's these offshoot, radical Islamic people. But that's not in Christianity. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. You want to know how they're getting a lot of us as Christians today? Did you know that spiritualism is put on a very form and fashion even in Christianity? And you want to know one of the ways? It's by little girls like that. Brothers and sisters, is there such thing as a talking backpack? But do you know how many of us give this to our children? We tell them, go ahead, look at Dora the Explorer. And we listen to the backpack, backpack. And we start listening to that backpack. And we say, and, and you know what happens? Dora, she has a backpack. You ever met little children that say they have their imaginary friend? Have you paid attention to the amount of homicides and parents being murdered by their own children and their children were told by their imaginary friends to do it? Spiritualism, brothers and sisters. This is all coming as a result of spiritualism. So Satan says, I got something for them Christian groups too. So he gives us Dora the Explorer. He gives us blues clues. When's the last time you heard your dog talk? Think about it, saints. 
We think these things are light, but these are not light. These are serious because there are Christian people that are putting this in front of their children on a regular basis. And Satan says, I'm getting you too, because all he needs to do is get you to believe that the real thing is not the real thing. Once he can allow that mind to ascend into that world, brothers and sisters, it becomes grossly deceptive. And not only that, Satan says, I'll graduate it even higher. I'll actually use Christian programs like VeggieTales. You ever paid attention to these stories? This is, what, this is what Christian households are giving to their children. Do you know how many lies are taught in VeggieTales? Do you know how many things are accounted in the scripture that VeggieTales literally takes out? Do you know how many times VeggieTales has talked about people that have died and have ascended into heaven? So somebody says, well, where is all of this leading to? You know where this leads to? Where does this deception lead to? You remember back in the days there was a guy by the name of Jim Jones, the cult of death. That was a whole bunch of Christian people. There was another insane man by the name of David Koresh, Waco, Texas. Brothers and sisters, listen, Satan says, I have it for every group under the sun. And this all comes through the lie of spiritualism. And therefore, we can look at others and say, oh, yeah, you know, I don't mess with Harry Potter, but we mess with some of this stuff. And we don't understand spiritualism is spiritualism. Doesn't matter if it's R-rated spiritualism or if it's PG-13 spiritualism. It's spiritualism, brothers and sisters. And it all leads to one road, deception. And Jesus says, let no man deceive you. Don't play with these things. The more that we feed our minds with these lies is the more that we'll set ourselves up for ultimately for failure. And if we're not careful, we will be lost. So therefore, we need to understand Back in Moses' day, what did God command should be done to people who taught that the dead were alive? It says, a man also, a woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. God did not play, brothers and sisters. God made it clear. He said, do not play with them. Any of these wizards, these necromancers and all that, God says, let them be stoned with stones because God knew the severity of spiritualism. I believe some of us, even in this room, we have to do a cleanup tonight. Some of us might have to go back home and take a real good look at our DVD sets and look at our VCR sets. And some of us have to look at what we downloaded and put on our iPads and iPods and what we're listening to. Spiritualism is come in the form of music. Spiritualism is coming in the form of television. It's coming in books. It's coming in every angle. And we need to be cleansed. Why will God's people not be deceived? Why? The Bible says very clearly. Notice. They received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. It may not always agree with your feelings, but everything must be tested by scripture. Everything. And therefore, I close on this point right here. Will the righteous people who are raised in the resurrection ever die again? You think they'll die again? Oh, no, brothers and sisters. The Bible says they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead. It says neither can they die anymore. I want to be part of that group. How about you? It also says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. I want to be part of this group. How about you? You want to be part of this group, eh? Brothers and sisters, we have to be willing to accept the whole truth, the whole truth, to be freed from the deceptions of Satan. And there, I leave you with this practical lesson. I want you to think about this practical lesson. We have learned tonight that the dead are dead. There's an appointed time for them to rise, and that's at the resurrection. For the saints, it's the first resurrection. For the sinners, it's the second. But we don't just ascend into heaven simply because we die. The Bible has made this clear. The dead are dead, and they no longer have anything to do with anything else that takes place under the sun. And if you understand that, let me hear you say amen. amen. Well, there's a practical lesson I leave you with, and it's found in Colossians chapter 3. This is our closing verse. In Colossians, the third chapter, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to consider verse 1. And this is what the Bible says in Colossians 3 and verse 1. The Bible says, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God.
Now watch this. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Why? Verse 3. For ye are dead. We are what? It says, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. You know, we read that when somebody comes to the grave of a dead person, they don't even know they're there. It says their emotions and their feelings are all gone. Is that the way you respond when temptation comes to you? When the world comes to you and calls you to practice its ways, are you dead to the world? Or do you find that you're still very much alive to the world? That when the world calls upon you, you say, yes, world, I'm here. You know, Christ wants to get us to a place where our love for him is so deep that we will become dead to the things of this world and our lives will be hid in Christ and God. And Christ says, that's a practical lesson I want you to learn about the state of the dead. Don't forget that. The dead know not anything. And when sin knocks on your heart's door to try to call you in, may we be able to be like the dead and not respond, for we know not anything, and we no longer have anything else to do with the living. And I believe that as we can learn that experience practically in our lives, we can get a practical lesson from the concept of the state of the dead. And therefore, if you believe the things that you've heard tonight and you are willing to let this be a truth that will protect you from deception, I want you to take that little card that you have, that little card that you have by your side, and I'm going to ask you to just put a check on the upper right-hand side. And if there's anybody who does not have that card, you just raise your hand, and we'll be happy to get that card to you right now. But if you have that card, I want you to take it, and then you're going to put a little check right on the right-hand side. And you're going to make it known to say, I believe the truth of what the Bible teaches about the state of the dead. And by God's grace, I will make sure my life is in harmony with this truth, even if it means that there's going to have to be a change in your entertainment, a change in what you read, a change in how you think about things in life and death. And may God bless you, for now you will be protected even from the deceptions or the wiles of the devil. You're putting a check on the right-hand side. And if you want to cooperate with Jesus all the way to be prepared for a soon coming that we do not slip up nor get tripped up by the deceptive tactics of Satan, then I would like to invite you, come to your knees with me as we go before the Lord in prayer to close out our time together and to thank the Lord for making this truth known to our hearts. And may we stand though the heavens may fall. Father in heaven, we are so grateful and we praise you and thank you for teaching us truth. You promise us that truth makes us free and it makes us free from error, even from sin. And Lord, there are some of us, we've been on the road in the path of deception, but by your grace, we want to be made free, Father. And I'm just thankful that you have taught us your words of truth today. You've made it plain to our hearts. And it may not resonate with our feelings, but Lord, I'm thankful that your word is above our feelings. Teach us to submit our feelings to your word rather than make your word submit to our feelings. And Lord, I pray that as we learn to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, may we leave this place not simply knowing the true state of the dead, but help us, Lord, to search our hearts, to remember that we are called to be dead, dead to the things of this world, that our lives are now to be hid in Christ, in God, and that we will not respond to the things that this world calls us to, but we will set our affections on things above. I thank you that with Jesus, this is possible. And so I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.